or you make your own. Um, so we're doing Lewis structures. So that's our theme for week seven. And right, I have my rainbow squid hat for a reason because of where we go with this. So in my humble opinion, this is one of the things we've been building to in chemistry. I mean, the moles, the naming, and the Lewis structures, this is we're working with chemical compounds. And um, yeah, I didn't start recording. And I put them in this order because most students actually do really well with the Lewis structures. It's very visual, it's drawing. Um, there is a pre-lecture video that walks through this most of this first page, we're gonna, um, I'm gonna review the steps with you and we're gonna do this page, the next two pages together. And um, I actually wrote the steps out on the board behind me, but the steps are actually in the lab, mostly grammatically correct, um, typed out in words, but let's just do a practice one here and we'll walk through the steps. Um, you're gonna have to tell me your valence electrons because if the valence electrons are wrong, everything else is wrong. So the pre-video is just the idea of how to do your Lewis structures. Um, so I talked about this with the naming. You guys have the advantage, my other class is ahead of you and so I know all the things I really have to emphasize. If you have not the periodic table you're using renumbered the groups with these A group numbers, please do so. So the halogens put in 8A, I'm sorry, the noble gases are 8A, halogens 7A, 6A, 5A, 4A, 3A. Uh, Lewis structures are um, working with non-metals, so we're just going to be using those. The A group, this A number, so the A group number is the valence electrons. And that is why it is a wonderful teaching tool. Um, so when I'm in lab and get a gaze at the nice, beautiful periodic tables we have in there, um, they we we had somebody climb up and renumber them for us just because it makes all the students' lives that much easier. Um, all right, so silicon is going to have four. I don't need to see the math. You're going to see me walk through it on some of these. Each oxygen has six, and there's two oxygens. So again, it's not the total electrons. It's just the ones after the noble gas core that have reacted. So we have 16 total electrons. That is the key step, because if that number's wrong. Second step is the center. The center is almost always the first element given. The center is the least greediest. So there is a term, I'm gonna actually skip to the last page for a moment, uh, or I am, called electronegativity. Uh, and there's apparently a symbol, a symbol for it. Electronegativity is their greed for electrons, how desperate they are to get that electron to get to the octet. Um, so over here, these guys wanna get rid of their electrons. And so their numbers are low. These were arbitrarily made up numbers by Linus Pauling. Linus Pauling was born in Portland, Oregon, down on Hawthorne and 34th is the Linus Pauling house where he was born. And the Ferry Museum is right next door. I don't know if you can go to it right now, but um, yeah, and then Third Eye something is actually right across the street. There's all this stuff. He was like this little vortex of energy when he came into this world and created the Hawthorne district I, around him, it seems like. Anyway, fluorine, what you need to know from this chart, fluorine is the greediest. So fluorine is the greediest. And number two, oxygen is number two. That is what drives our life, is this greed for electrons by oxygen. Fluorine's too greedy for us to, that would, yeah. Halogens, you don't want them in your body. That's why that uh, fake sugar where they put chlorine in it, that that scares the bejeebies out of me that anyone would put that in their body. Um, but 
what drives our life is the breathing of oxygen, oxygen desperately wanting electrons and it, it pulls the electrons out of our food. It's why you can eat crappy food and are still alive because um, it still has electrons. You can actually eat cardboard and survive because of those electrons, right? Or you can realize we're all quantum beings. Um, so compounds are written from the least greediest to the most greediest. And so the center is going to be given first. The exception to that, I'm pretty sure I talk about in the video, and it's the exception to every one of these steps, and it's hydrogen if it shows up. Hydrogen, we show it first um, because it's element number one. It can never be in the center. Anyone know why? I know Damon does because he responded to my question in the video. I don't know if there. Um, so hydrogen, can we make one bond? Because it's element number one. We'll see that as we get through this. All right, so you make a single line. Start with a single line. The most missed thing on this is students wanting double bonds. Double bonds is the very last thing. It's the last resort. They don't want to share. Um, and so they really don't want to do double bonds unless they have to. All right, so a single bond, that line is two shared electrons. It counts for both sides. But we first do the greedy ones. They're on the outside because they get their octet. So oxygen gets its octet. And you're going to show it as dots. The dots are always in pairs. Remember that whole thing we did with the uh, electron spinning? One up, one down. That keeps showing up. So we show them in pairs. I recommend, again, in the video I talk about this, that you show this in the north, south, east, west grid because it makes it really easy to see the octet. So each of my oxygens has their octet. Um, if you didn't watch the video, Please do watch it after a class because it will help you. And some students, they like to watch the pre-lecture after because they find it actually makes more sense once we've talked about it some. I don't know. Um, and now we deal with the center. So you do the greedy ones on the outside first, and then we do the center. Please do this in pencil. And if you didn't go and buy a good eraser, that would be a wonderful investment because um, you're going to use it on this lab. So if you have extra electrons, you're going to put them on the center as dots. So remember this number? That's how we know if we have extra. So you're going to count. And if you drew this nicely, you have 8 plus 8 more. We have 16. We've used up all our electrons, but we are not done. The center needs an octet, too. So it's like it went into a business deal and... It didn't work out. It's, it didn't get anything from this. So this is not going to happen how it is. So we have to make, we have to share more. So when you make a double bond, and again, it has this worded in the lab. I'm, yeah, in the lab, for some people who like to read, recommend you all read, that you're going to have to actually erase two and move them into that, make another bond. So now this is four electrons that are shared. That's what a double bond is. Um, now, my other class, they keep crossing out and showing me how they crossed out. You can erase. You don't have to show me the X. It doesn't matter which of these electrons you cross out, but you have to cross out a pair because of how electrons show up in pairs. Um, I do it because I don't have an eraser. I'm using pen. But if you use pencil, you can just erase and make a double bond. We're not done. The silicon needs two more. So we would race from the other oxygen. And that's what our picture looks like. Um, we'll do the next one together. And also, or if you watch the video, you can just cruise through these. Um, and then we're going to add these other steps. All right. So adding up, or actually, I'm going to stop recording. At least add up your valence electrons and make your basic structure. So go through these first few steps, count your valence electrons, 
put your center and put your line to each. There is one center. All of these have one center. So don't make, make them strung out in a line. This is a sulfur with three oxygens around it. Um, and then give your octet to the outside. And then I will walk through the rest of it with you. I'm going to stop the recording for like five minutes to give you a chance to do that. Because if, sure. Um, so Stephen just asked me a question. So they're all wanting to be eight. The octet rule, they're not satisfied. So his question was specifically about sulfur, but this works for any of them. So when you add up your electrons here, the sulfur has six. But when you make your diagram, it needs to have eight. So they all end up with eight. The exception is hydrogen. Um, and we'll talk about that. Uh, so it's not where they started. Where they started matters for counting our electrons. So we get to 24 for this one. Um, and so there are, I used to teach it this way and I stopped because it doesn't work. Um, and, and so that's why the only reason I'm mentioning this is because YouTube's so wonderful. You can get so many people having all their gimmicks and it doesn't, sorry. Um, I recommend you do your north, south, east, west. So it's not where the sulfur was. Like if you do this and you give your octet to the oxygens, you're at 24 because you have eight, eight, and eight. Um, and the sulfur has six. So the line counts as two for each side it's attached to. So the sulfur has two, four, six. And so, and it might be that I misunderstood your question too, Stephen, but um, that you don't want to look and say, okay, sulfur six, we're good, because sulfur was six. It, they're all not happy until they get to the eight. So we want to get to eight. You can't just add dots because you don't have any more. So you have to share. Does that kind of answer what you were asking, maybe? Uh, yeah, thank you. Or maybe as we go through more of these, that will help. It takes practice, and that's why the lab is four pages, um, like 24 more of these that you're going to draw. And we'll do some also on Thursday during the practice. Now, when you go double bond, actually, double bonds is the biggest mistake students make. Um, students go double bond crazy. Ask yourself, how many double bonds do I need? So we have two, four, six. We just need one more bond to get to eight. It does not matter where you put the double bond. You can put it on the left, the right, or below. Wherever you erase your two electrons, whichever oxygen you give up two electrons, those two electrons go into the bond. That's where you show the double bond. Um, so you can't like erase these two electrons and put the double bond down there. Now, with that said, this is what's called a resonance. Again, part of Linus Pauling's brilliance. He won two Nobel Prizes. Um, only one other person ever did that. He, he should have won a third. Um, but our government rewarded him by taking away his passport because they thought he was a communist. Um, a resonance is that it doesn't really have double and single bonds. This double bond actually floats between all of them. Um, that's a really advanced concept. Some students see it. I see this in three dimensions. Uh, and I didn't realize that most people don't see things in three dimensions in their brain. So I guess kind of like what computers do rotating around. Um, I have a twin brother, and he sees like that. And so I just assumed always my whole life that everybody sees things like that. But um, it is a resonance. These oxygens are all equivalent. They all have eight electrons. The sulfur now has two, four, six, eight. It's just sharing all eight of them. All right, the NO2 negative. This negative just means you add an electron. Just like when we did all the stuff with ions. Um, <clears throat> you may know what the name of that ion would be. This would have 5 plus 12 plus one more, so we get 18. So if you have negative, you add electrons. If you have a positive, you just take away. 
The only thing the negative does, that's nitrite, by the way, because nitrate was NO3 negative. If you didn't make your nice little polyatomic, you don't need this huge list that everyone has out there. Keep it simple, like I said. Um, anyway, nitrite just means it lost one oxygen. All right, 18 is our total. Nitrogen goes in the center. So when is oxygen not going to be on the outside in its greedy heaven? Well, there's only one greedier than that, and that's fluorine. So if oxygen's with fluorine, oxygen gets stuck in the center. Turns out, out there in nature, never happens. Oxygen and fluorine never combine. But guess what? We as humans, we made the compound. And it's extremely toxic because it's extremely reactive because they're miserable, always. Um, the other time oxygen gets in the center is with hydrogen which is the perfect molecule of water. All right, again, I'm drawing these as flat molecules. We will describe the three-dimensionality over here, and I'll talk about that. So it doesn't matter if you put the oxygens above and below to the right and below. It's just that we have two oxygens around the nitrogen. Now, before you start making double bonds, take a deep breath. Breathing is really nice. And you count. You have 8 plus 8, which is 16. Oh, we have extras. You take care of the extras. We put them on the nitrogen. So we have 8 plus 8, which is 16, 17, 18. So put the extras on the center. So again, when you do the lab, there are those steps. Or if you go back and watch the pre-lecture video um, and walking through the steps. And all right. We're not done because my center has two, four, six. So I need one double bond. So I'm going to move these two electrons into a double bond. My oxygen still has two, four, six, eight. This still has two, four, six, eight. And my nitrogen has two, four, six, eight. We're good. Now, technically, when something has a charge, you are supposed to put brackets. With the negative, your teacher forgets 90% of the time. So if you don't show that, that's okay. But it does show without that negative, this would not have worked. Uh, we would have ended up with an odd number. Um, oh, this is a resonance also. I knew there was something. So resonance is when you have a single and a double. You, I don't ask you about it, but it does help some students because that double bond could have been on the left or the right. It doesn't matter. Um, they were both in oxygen. All right, the next one. This is carbon, two chlorines, two fluorines. That gives you 32 electrons. Carbon loves to be in the center. Carbon is always in the center. Um, and it's here in the middle. It's a 4A. It, it loves to be in the center because, all right, we put a chlorine, another chlorine, a fluorine, and another fluorine. Now, it doesn't matter. We're making a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional molecule. You could have put fluorine, fluorine, chlorine, chlorine, or you could have put the chlorines across and the fluorines across, because nothing is across from anything else. We're going to look at the three-dimensionality. You put your dots on the outside. These dots are called lone electrons or electron pairs. Um, green pen is not working. That gives me an octet for each of the outside, six of their own and one sh or two shared in the bond. And my center has two, four, six, eight. And I have eight, 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 which is 32. I've had students who say, I love the 32s. There's no double bonds. In fact, halogens don't make double bonds. Why? Well, the answers are on your periodic table. The halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, they're just one away from perfection. They just need one bond. The double bonds start happening when you're two, three, four away, that they need multiple electrons to get to the octet. 
All right, you can ponder that. Uh, the NF3, this is the one that was in the pre-video. This gives you 26, so 5 from the nitrogen and then 21, 7 from each of the three fluorines. I don't need to see the math. Nitrogen gets the center because fluorine is the greediest of them all. Dots. And you can Google what electronegativity is if you don't like my explanation of greedy. Um, they have made a whole new chart of electronegativity because some other Nobel laureate, apparently competitiveness is a prized possession of people once they have a Nobel Prize. They didn't like Linus Pauling's, so I keep Linus Pauling's because he's one of my heroes. His other Nobel Prize was for, um, he organized hundreds of thousands of scientists and people um, anti-nuclear testing. So this is back in the 50s. Um, he should want another one because he's also the vitamin C guy. All right. Uh, so we have 888. The extras go on the center. No double bonds. So part of the double bond issue is probably your teacher's fault because these first three I did with the double bonds are a thing that students have trouble with. So I did examples and then uh, they really, in nature, double bonds are extremely reactive. And so they exist, but there are not that many of them. All right, H2O is just eight electrons. So the hydrogens are just one, and then the oxygen. Oxygen gets the center. Hydrogens are always, again, on the outside. Now, there's something, I don't remember, it was in the video, um, but I call it hydrogen hell. Don't put dots on the hydrogen. Hydrogen cannot, does not do an, well, it has the octet rule, but there are never any dots on the hydrogen. It just makes it stupid. Um, and that is, you may know, I think I asked it in the video. Hydrogen, its octet is helium. The octet rule is they want to be like a noble gas. And helium only has two electrons because this first row had only the S's. There's no P's, so just two electrons. So hydrogen, all it ever does is make one bond. It's always on the outside. It makes one bond, and that's it. No dots on the hydrogen. The dots go on the oxygen, and that gives us eight. Hydrogen cannot double bond. It can't have multiple. It can't have dots. It just makes a single bond. It's always on the outside. Now, this is water. And many of you have taken biology. You can draw your water like this. This is how we draw it. But we're going to show the dots because we're doing Lewis dot structures. And this is how they know that the water has the bend is from these structures and those lone pairs. And that's what we're going to move into now. Is there any other questions, though, about the drawing? That is the purpose of the lab um, is to get practice with drawing them. And so I have lots of office hours. Um, today and Thursday and Saturday. Um, your lab is due Thursday, but um, yeah. So you can have me look at your lab before you submit it. All right. So I'm pretty sure in the video, I started talking about the Vesper geometry and the Vesper geometry is, I'm gonna do it on the other page here. The Vesper geometry is, the total number of clouds. Again, in the lab, uh, reading the lab can help, especially after you do the lab, going back and reading the lab, there's a lot of information packed into those two pages. So it is the total number of clouds around the center. So they're called electron clouds and it's around the center. Everything's about the center. And you can either have atoms attached to the center, so I call them atom clouds or bonding clouds, or you can have lone electron pairs, and again, this is on the center. So these are non-bonding clouds. So this chart, I'm not gonna fill in here, it is actually in your lab, um, but we're gonna walk through it here. So the clouds, you don't have to circle your clouds, but it is around the center. I do it as a teaching tool because it helps me to explain this. So this has two clouds, and I'm going to write that here. When you have two clouds total, uh, this is called linear. The bond angle is 180 degrees. 
So these clouds always have a negative to them. Um, and that is because, remember, the atom, the positive is concentrated way far deep in the center. And so this is all really electrons taking up the space. And we know that negatives are going to repel each other, get as far apart as they can. But they're stuck. They're stuck to the silicon. And so they're going to pull as far apart as they can, which is 180 degrees. So this bond angle here, they will end up straight across from each other. The word linear is just a word that describes 180. And this is actually, I made my molecules. We were in lab, you get these molecule kits. And somebody like desperately is like, I need to borrow one of those. Um, we might be able to arrange that. But that's the carbon. This represents the double bonds and the oxygen. And it's straight across and makes a line. And we'll worry about the molecular geometry in a moment. All right, these next two, there's three clouds, one, two, three. So it's not the number of bonds, it's the number of things attached. This also has three clouds. So when you have three clouds, we call that, it makes a triangle. The word planar means it is flat. It's not planter triangle. We're not planting them. Uh, it's a flat two-dimensional, we're still in two-dimensionality up here. Uh, this is also planar triangle. We're going to get another answer, but it is that these three oxygens or the oxygens in the lone pair are attached to the center and they're going to spread out as far as they can, which is 120 degrees. So we call it planar triangle or trigonal planar. Uh, you cannot just call it planar because linear is also planar. You can't just call it a triangle because there's going to be a three-dimensional triangle we're going to get. So please call it both words. You can show the symbol for the triangle, but you have to have both words there. All right, so again, lone pair on the center gets its own space. It actually takes up more space than the bonded, the oxygen. Um, so this is actually like 119, but let's go with 120. Let's keep it simple. So 180. That is 180, 120, and then these three down here, they all have four clouds. So four atoms, three atoms in the lone pair, or two atoms and two lone pairs. Any way you draw water, you have two atoms, two hydrogens, and two lone pairs, two sets of, and so four clouds is what all of these have, and that is a tetrahedral or a tetrahedron. I always call it a tetrahedral. Um, tetra means four. We saw that before um, when we were doing naming. Uh, tetrahedral is an adjective. Tetrahedron is um, a noun. It is considered one of the most sacred of all the geometries, and it is in the center of every molecule. In our body. Um, and so these guys who are really into the sacred geometries, um, it's interesting what we've created. So it is three-dimensional. These hydrogens are not 90 degrees. They actually can pull into a three-dimensionality where every single one of them is 109-ish degrees. We're going with 109. It is actually 109.5, 107, 104.5. Uh, and so if you want to be like, think you're smarter than everybody. So what I saw in my other class, something I've never seen in 25 years, 26 now. Um, and I just sat there and scratched my head. I had a student coming up with bond angles I never would have even thought of. And I don't know where she was getting them from. Um, so I don't know what is out there online or if she was just making them up, thinking you can make up any number. Um, these are the only bond angles we're going to work with, 180, 120, and 109. So she was having like 63, 82. There, so no, let's just go with these. Um, so if there are four clouds, it's 109-ish. So that's where my ish comes from. All right. So we're going to add this next piece, which is the molecular geometry. 
So the molecular geometry, again, I'm going to go to the previous page just so I have more space. Usually I have three luxurious boards to write on. So the Vesper geometry is the total clouds, and that is the bond angle always comes from that. Those two always go together. So that is your total clouds that you can either have two, three, or four. Sorry. Just, it's just that. Um, the molecular shape is if you have lone electrons on the, sem on the center, we will get a molecular shape. It's sometimes called molecular shape. Um, when I first started teaching, most places now call it molecular geometry. I don't, I don't care. Um, which, and so you'll see I'm inconsistent. Sometimes I call it molecular geometry in the next sentence, molecular shape. It means the same thing. It's looking at the whole molecule. And when you look at the molecule, if you have dots, you can't see the dots. So these guys are both the planar triangle, but those are the lone electrons. Those lone electrons push these oxygens down. Pretend like those are red. I ran out of red balls. Um, so they push these oxygens down. So really this nitrogen, because of this lone pair up here, those oxygens get pushed down into a 120 degree angle. And so we call it bent. If we could actually see the molecule, if we were gnomes and could see it, it would have a bent shape to it. As opposed to up here, there's no lone electrons. The oxygens are truly straight across from each other. So it's linear again. If there are no lone pairs, you repeat yourself. Linear, linear. Or you can just write really big across two boxes one time linear. Like this would be planar triangle, planar triangle. It's, it really fascinates me because it has to do with how your brain is wired. Um, so some of you are fine writing linear once and some of you need to fill in every space. So I will fill in every space. Um, but if there's no lone electrons, the Vesper geometry is the molecular geometry. If you have lone electrons on the center, you're gonna have two answers. Planar triangle is the Vesper, because there were three clouds. Bent is what it actually looks like. Because again, those lone electrons are pushing the oxygens down and we end up with a bent shape. So we get to four. Which one's still a tetrahedral? Well, the first one is still a tetrahedral because it's all four, all four of the atoms are there, they're pushing each other apart. This is why when you made your drawing, it doesn't matter if you put the fluorines across from each other or next to each other. So if you did fluorine, fluorine, chlorine, chlorine, it's the same thing because nothing in the tetrahedral is across from each other. They are all at 109 degree angles. Um, and so it is not flat like a pancake or Kansas. All right, the next one, we have a lone pair. It pushes these down. So what we really have is these fluorines are being pushed down. So some students like to redraw it. So make your first initial drawing with the north, south, east, west grid. And then if you see lone electrons, for some students, just how their visual, visualization goes, you can put that lone electron and push those fluorines down. And this gives us a pyramid. So as opposed to our SO3 up here. This one is truly, there's nothing pushing the oxygens. They are in just two dimensions and they're 120 apart. But these, that lone pair pushes the fluorines down. And so it is three dimensions. It is, you can just say a pyramid. I am perfectly fine with that in here. In 222, it is called a triangle based pyramid. And that is because the base of the pyramid is a triangle. So not like the great pyramids in Egypt or any of the other ones that are built all around that are square-based pyramids. These are triangle-based pyramids. All right. And then the last one with water, these lone pairs, um, they would be like taking two of these off. And so the holes that are there are lone pairs. 
they're pushing the hydrogens down. And so the high, um, this ends up with our 109 degree bond angle, and we're back to bent. So we had bent twice. We had bent here, and we had a bent there. What's the difference between the two bents? Here's my bent. Here's my water molecule. Anybody? The Vesper geometry? Yes, which means the bond angle is different. I kind of feel like when Stephen answers, he's just like, she's so desperate. I'll just give her an answer. Um, thank you for answering. Um, so because this one up here, this bent is a planar triangle. It's 120 degrees in that bend. In this one, because it's a tetrahedral bent, it's actually more bendy. It's 109 degrees. Now, back in the day when I first started teaching, they used to call the one angular and the other one bent to distinguish them. And you can call it, you can do that. I don't care. I'm sure online you can find all sorts of names. So some people call these angular. That's a lot more letters to write. So I call it bent. And some places call it V-shaped for the victory sign. But like, why couldn't it be an upside down V? Because that's how we usually show, show water. Um, so there are other names that you will see for some of these. But we're going to go with bent because it has a bend. So with all of this, this is the chart that is in your lab. This chart over here, we just walked through filling this out, but we walked through it with examples. Um, and so, and again, that chart is in the lab. This is the exact order the chart is in the lab. The first page of your lab should give you these same answers. We still have one more column to do. Um, don't just copy them. Do it and make sure you understand it. That's what the first page is. And then it starts mixing them up. And so you can see it. But all of this is leading to, if it's the polar bear. So there's mama polar bear. She's ginormous. She's got her little babies. Um, again, this is why we did this, the polar nonpolar. So. In my humble opinion, this is one of the two most important things that we do in chemistry, um, is the idea of polar versus nonpolar. So we're going to go to the next page, and then we'll come back and fill this in. Um, yeah. So um, I spent a lot of time redoing my notes, because this ends up being one of the hardest things for students to grasp. But in this environment, my other class picked it up pretty well. The other piece that I think, the other thing that I think is one of the most important things to get is um, oxidation reduction. So that's what we do next week after the celebration of learning. So there'll be, normally the, the, the test is one hour, and then there would be lecture after. So I've already recorded it. And then... Um, there would actually be two hours of lecture. So it's two separate videos that will show up for you next week. And um, yeah, this is a fun story goes with it. I, I had my face painted and then I made a lot of smoke in the lab. And so I had the door propped open because they don't have any of the fans on on the weekend. And then the security guy came in. And and he gave me his blessing, and I didn't realize until I got home that my whole face was painted. I totally forgot, and I was like, oh, my gosh, this guy probably was, like, just running to get out of there. But, um, yeah. All right, so electronegativity. Linus Pauling, he came up with this idea to explain how molecules look. So this idea of Lewis structures, this is, like, from the 50s. Um, and so it's only 70 years old. Maybe that sounds really old to you, but it's not. The whole idea of molecules is really less than a century old. Um, and he did it because he was a biochemist. That's what my background is. Um, and it was so that they could understand how proteins look, how everything looks in our body to try to understand it is what gave way to figuring out the DNA, the molecule of DNA, which unfortunately was over propaganda eyes, and now we all believe that our DNA determines who we are, which is not true. Our DNA, only 2% of our DNA codes for proteins, 
There's 98% of our DNA that doesn't code for anything. No other species is like that. Every other species on this planet, all of their DNA codes for proteins. So we have 98% extra. That actually, any of you are musicians, it does actually have a musical rhythm to it. It has a vibration because music's a vibration. We're getting back to the quantum thing. And so there is so much more to the DNA than the pattern. Anyway, Linus Pauling would have figured out the structure of DNA, but again, they took away his passport. Um, so he came up with this to try to explain this term at the bottom of the page. So hydrophobia is, uh, it means, I'm putting quotes around it, fear of water. Molecules do not have emotions. Uh, they don't have fear. But if something is going to be soluble or insoluble is determined from this polarity and that determines a lot of what goes on with us so the whole cholesterol thing and blood clots and getting ill comes back to polarity and then also oxidation reduction which we'll do next week um, so bond polarity what the word polar means is that something is pooling that you have a pool and so that's what it is so like on this planet we have polarity um, and yes, this gets back to magnetism. We just haven't used that in the explanation yet. That's, you're not going to find that yet because people haven't accepted that's all about magnetism. Um, actually, I read an article this past week and they said, could this all really be magnetism? Um, so it's important because it explains, again, what dissolves in water and what doesn't. And why that's important is we are 75% water. This planet also is mostly water, so it determines when things are gonna, like why we have those plastic islands and how to clean them up uh, and get things back to how the balance should be. Um, so it comes from the bonds. If you have two of the same, there's no pool. And so we call that non-polar. So two things that are the same, they're not gonna be pooling because they're the same. When you have two things that are different, there is a pool. In this case, the fluorine is pooling. So there is a pool to the fluorine towards the greediest. The pool is to the greedy. It's an electron pool. So it's a, there's um, a pool. So what's happening here is these guys are covalent. They are sharing electrons. But they're like little children sharing electrons. I'll share because mom told me I had to. But as long as everything's closer to me, I'm okay with that. Um, and so we call this polar. So rather than saying pool, we say polar. Um, here again, two different ones. The nitrogen is pooling. How I know that is nitrogen. You don't need to memorize the chart. You don't need to have the chart. Fluorine is the greediest. That's one of the big take home messages. It is what explains polarity. It's what is gonna explain oxidation next week, that as you move towards the fluorine and the oxygen, there is more pool. Um, and so you can either show it with an arrow and we put, this is the electropositive is the carbon, the one that's not electronegative, electropositive, or they show these, it's a delta, um, a lowercase delta is signed in um, Greek symbol because polar is an adjective and so somebody said well we need a noun and so it's called a dipole um, so the I'm sorry the carbon would get the positive and so this is another way you'll see it and I mention this because some of you are, are in biology classes and biology classes they love showing it like this um, and you might see me doing that sometimes explaining and especially when we get into Chemistry 222, we finally get to molecules. So chemistry 221 is really um, about atoms and the molecules and the math. But in 222, we look at the three-dimensionality and we take this all a step further. Um, and people who've taken more math, they like to show it with the vectors and stuff. So this one we would say is polar. And so I usually just use the abbreviation NP and P for polar and nonpolar. All right, so two different. So if you have two different atoms, there is going to almost always be a pool. 
in our class, there will be. There is one exception that you need to know because it is why plastic doesn't mix with water. Carbon and hydrogen is nonpolar. It is where the definition of nonpolar and electronegativity came from. It is how the other piece that allowed him to make up these numbers. And even when they expanded and came up with a new electronegativity table, carbon and hydrogen is nonpolar. It does not mix with water. And so the technical definition, I'm not going to write it down, but an electronegativity difference of 0.4 or less is considered nonpolar. Again, these rules have changed slightly because they had to come up with a new table. Um, and if it's more than 0.4, it's considered polar. That just seems like a lot of tedious stuff and math. Um, you see, if you have something, fluorine, oxygen, this corner here pools. They're going to be pooling. Now, there's one thing that you all know from two weeks ago when we started this. This last one is ionic. So if you see a metal and a nonmetal, you are beyond pooling. They are no longer sharing. You've actually transferred the electron. So the electron has actually moved from the metal to the nonmetal. So you have a true positive and a true negative. So the sodium is positive, the fluorine is negative. And uh, that's what these are. These are partial or areas of positivity and negativity. So there is a pool within the molecule, whereas these are a positive-negative attraction. When we look at the whole molecule, we look for symmetry. So if it's symmetrical, it's nonpolar. Um, and we'll go back to that in a moment. I want to finish this page since I have the notes here. Uh, so dihydrogen monoxide would just be our technical name for water. Um, right? So two hydrogens and one oxygen. Um, and so hydrophobia, water is polar. Anything that is nonpolar is hydrophobic. So chemists call it polar and nonpolar because we are not looking only at water, but when you take biology, biochemistry, we there call it hydrophobia. Well, I say hydrophobia, joking. It's called hydrophobic. Um, so something that is nonpolar is hydrophobic, and it doesn't mix with water. So I was thinking about this yesterday because as I was biking, my glasses were initially getting foggy because it was so cold. Um, and so what you do, like for people who ski or snowmobile or ride motorcycles, is you get this stuff that you spray on, and it is nonpolar. And it's so that the water doesn't stick to your, uh, so you don't fog up. Um, and so it's hydrophobic. Uh, if something likes water, so if there is a pool or if it's ionic, we call it hydrophilic. So Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. This term means love. So it loves water. So again, it's looking at it very much, does it like water or not? Because it's looking at the human body. Um, or dissolving. So soluble would be polar likes polar, and insoluble would be polar and nonpolar. Um, so that's what the joke is about the polar bears versus the grizzly bears. All right, so let's take this back to my other page and add that last piece. Um, which is the whole purpose of this. This is in a straight line. The oxygens are pooling. There is a pool by the oxygens, but they are pooling straight across from each other. So like in 222, you actually have to draw in the polarities. These oxygens are pooling equal but opposite. So there is no net pool. Overall, it is nonpolar. You do not need to draw in the polarities because that usually confuses students initially, um, but uh, nonpolar, so it would not mix with water. And again, yeah, that was CO2, but CO2 is not very water soluble at all. All right, the next one is also nonpolar. 
and this is my story, whether you read them or not. Um, a lot of students said they do actually end up reading the stories because it actually explains stuff in the stories. Um, this one, they are all equally dispersed. The oxygens all have eight electrons. It is not the bond that pulls, it is the oxygen. These oxygens are all pulling, but they're all pulling symmetrically. So again, because that double bond, there's still eight electrons around the oxygen because it's a resonance, which means that double bond is actually everywhere at once, but we draw it like this. It's really a one and a third bond. So rather than having two singles and a double, you have a one and a third bond. Some people like that, that helps, or they just go, okay, the double bond doesn't pull any different than the single bond. Um, bents are polar. If something is bent, there's it's it's got a kink. If you have something that's kinked, you have a pull. These guys are not across from each other, so they're pulling down. You have a net pull down by the oxygens. And so that would be polar. Um, all right. Same with the water, it is polar. Any type of bent you have polar. There's one other thing I want to mention with the bents, because this is something that amuses me, and you'll all hopefully not do this, is I will have students describe something as linear and bent. And I'm still trying to figure out how you can be linear and have a bend, because that's not possible. And so if you're calling it linear bent, you're not getting the big picture. So um, if it's linear, it's linear. And if it's bent, it's either a planar triangle bent or a tetrahedral bent. That just means the different bond angles. Pyramids are also going to be polar because of the lone pair. So another way of saying it is if you have a lone pair, it's going to cause it to be asymmetrical. It's going to be pushing things out of alignment, and that's going to make there be an asymmetrical distribution of the charge, which is going to allow a pull. So all these fluorines have a negative area around them. And so that's going to cause a pull. And so water is going to have an attraction to this negative part. In water, the negative part would be the oxygen. And so the oxygen would have an attraction. They're not going to be bonded, but it would be attracted. This would be water soluble. All right, this one here is polar. And I did this one on purpose. And... Oh, I don't have it made. We'll make it real quick. So in a tetrahedral, so this is a tetrahedral. So you have the chlorines are the green. And there's no way you can get the green balls across from each other. Nothing's across from each other. If it's a tetrahedral, it's three dimensions. The only way a tetrahedral could be nonpolar is what? Anybody? This is, we get this. Would it be if they were all the same element? It is. Thank you. So um, you must see in three dimensions, too. But yeah, it's back to that one that I had with everything around it is the same. So unless these were all chlorines or all fluorines, so even though we think fluorines pull, if they're all fluorines, they're going to cancel each other out. So here, these two fluorines, you can draw it however you want in two dimensions, but again, it's three-dimensional. Um, and so as soon as one of them is different, it makes it polar. And... Any questions? I'm going to stop.